Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live. My name is Zara Arboleta with Valley Children's Healthcare, uh, talking about COVID-19 and emotional well-being. Uh, joined by two of our experts here at Valley Children's, we have uh, Dr. Amanda Suplee, a pediatric psychologist. Dr. Suplee, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And then we also have Deanna Vegas with Peters, who is our Director of Patient and Family Services. Uh, she also is a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, Deanna, thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me. So we, uh, this is the second in our virtual health series here at Valley Children's. Last week we were doing COVID uh, 101 uh, with Dr. Niall Mason, our infectious disease expert. And today um, we are talking about something that so many families have been asking us here at Valley Children's, and that is how do we cope with COVID-19, sheltering in place, no school, the stresses of it, and how do we help our children cope? We're now approaching week 12. It seems like week 85, but week 12 of uh, sheltering in place. Uh, schools are now out. Kids have been missing a lot of their activities. Um, and one of the biggest things people have been asking, uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Supli, is what are signs of stress in kids? What are you seeing, kids and adolescents? Really, we're looking for changes in behavior. So one of the most notable things that we're seeing is irritability. And this is an increase in irritability um, than what may be normal for them or for an adolescent. Um, they are easy to anger, easy to cry often when asked to do things, or starting to even withdraw and shut down um, and keep to themselves more often. Are there some kids who might be having a harder time? I've got two little ones, a fifth and a sixth grader. One's pretty introverted, seems to be doing okay. My other one, the social butterfly, seems to be a bit, having a bit of a harder time. Absolutely, every child is different. Um, every person is different. And so we're seeing a wide variety of how people are coping and especially within children. Children who, um, are naturally more social. I think we're seeing a lot more struggle right now because they aren't able to be with their friends. And I think virtual connection is just not the same. And um, for children who are, tend to keep to themselves in general, maybe don't have as many friends and that's okay. They actually are doing decently well. I'd also like to say children are very resilient. Um, and so a lot of children are coping pretty well during this time. And I think we're going to see a wide range of um, common emotions and reactions. Deanna, uh, the mommy and daddy guilt um, can be strong regardless when you're trying to juggle a job and your kids. Uh, right now, though, uh, we are hearing from a lot of caregivers and parents uh, who feel it's almost their fault that their kids might be having a hard time with this, but that's not, that's not the case, right? It's not the mom or dad's fault. No, absolutely not. This is no one's fault and there's no time to put blame on any of us for this. This is a circumstance that has occurred that's beyond everyone's control. Um, I think what's really important to keep in mind is that every child, every parent, Every household is different. And there's gonna be days when we are rock stars in how we're managing things at home, and then days when we're just not so much. And I think what's really important is that um, as parents and as adults, um, that we give ourselves some grace and some room to recognize when we are drawing from strength and doing okay, and when we maybe don't have such great days. And that is a, a tough one because moms and dads, uh, are juggling working from home full time, the children's schoolwork. Luckily, that part is is slowly ending for a lot of school districts, um, and then also adapting with the new shelter in place. What are some tips uh, either of you can give for um, caregivers, for parents to to stay calm and to to stay patient? So I'll start first. I think one of the things for a parent is to be realistic in terms of the expectations that's put in place for themselves and for their family, especially for the parent or parents that might be working from home who are trying to juggle, doing the daycare, doing school up to up until now and trying to work at home. That is a lot to manage. Um, and for those 
those of us who um, like perfection, um, expecting 100% perfection and doing all of these things is not realistic. We need to cut ourselves some slack and recognize this is a very unique and challenging situation in time. And to really just consistently evaluate what are our goals? What is our plan from week to week as we are trying to maneuver through this time? Dr. Amanda, would you like to talk a little bit more in terms of the kids and managing for them? Absolutely. One thing I've talked a lot with my families about is you coming up with some sort of structure and routine that works for your family. There are going to be some families who are able to structure every minute of every day, but there are going to be many families who aren't able to do that, and both are okay. The most important thing is just to have some consistency. Um, children really crave consistency is what they do at school. They know what time they're doing math. They know what time they're doing reading. So if you can come up with a plan for your family, that can be really helpful. Um, if that, in that includes just the only structure of the day is getting up and changing into a new pair of PJs, that's okay. If that's what works for your family. Um, the other thing that can be really helpful is including your children in creating that schedule that can give them some control in the situation and to give them some predictability in a very chaotic situation. So uh, there have been a lot of people who are saying, I've been letting my child play with the iPad or watch a little more TV or be on the computer a little longer. Um, before, Dr. Zipley used to tell everybody, you got a limit screen time, you have to really monitor that. Uh, do you have advice for people? Because sometimes the only moment of peace a parent can have is to let their child play on that iPad for an hour or two, or maybe sometimes a little longer. <laughs> Absolutely. And it is normal, especially during this time when there's very limited activities that you can do to do more electronics. Um, the only thing I encourage is still try to limit that as much as possible. Play is very important for children's development. Um, and even into adolescence, being able to do some sort of arts and crafts is very important. So taking time away from the screens is also um, needed. And also to, to still want to limit as much as possible um, with some wiggle room and then also monitor what your children are doing. I don't think that should, um, should go away. Monitor the social media websites that they're on or the news um, websites that they are on just to make sure that they're getting appropriate information or interacting with the appropriate people. Uh, so this next one is, is for either of you. Uh, there are probably very, when this first happened and everybody went into the shelter in place mode um, in February, not sure anyone really realized just how long this would go because it went from, oh, maybe kids will go back to school in May. Oh, maybe the first week of June. And that's certainly not the case anymore. Uh, do either of you have advice on um, uh, for caregivers on how to explain, especially for younger kids, um, that this is still ongoing, and how do you explain to them that this could be our new normal for a while? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's really important to have open and honest conversations. At this point, your children have been exposed to it in some way, whether it's they are realizing school is done now and they're not going back, or they've heard you talking about it or have seen it in some sort of media form. Um, so being honest with them and asking them, especially for younger children, what do you know and what are you worried about? And that way you're not assuming that they're just not exposed to it. You can have a conversation and then just being honest, we don't know what this is gonna look like long-term and the, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. The governor today announced uh, the easing of restrictions in even more counties. Some counties are gonna start moving into phase three of reopening. It means a lot more people are gonna be out and about in public places. Um, kids uh, might not be used to masks um, and all these rules because they haven't been in stores or businesses for several months now. What are some tips either of you can give to help uh, acclimate children uh, to a different scene when they are out in public? Really important to expose them to these types of things in their own environment first. So one thing we, we talked about play being important is playing with a mask on a stuffed animal or on a doll so they're exposed to something that might seem a little scary at first and then having them practice at home before they go out. So they're used to people like in your family or used to the sensation of it on their their face before they go out in public and then being honest with them is like this is what you're going to see people are going to be wearing masks and it's a way for us to keep other people healthy and to keep ourselves healthy and giving children a little bit of control and that can actually go a long way for them to be able to cope 
And Deanna, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of people out in the different communities who can offer support and help for families. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of resources that have surfaced in the last three months. It's amazing as you do a search either by going onto some of the websites from the County Behavioral Health Department um, sites. There's a lot of information there. Um, there are warm lines where people who are maybe feeling isolated and just need to speak with somebody, you can actually call a number 24 seven to be able to talk to another person on the phone. These are not therapists, these are persons like us who are just trying to get through, who will provide a listening ear. Facebook has an extraordinary amount of support groups that have also surfaced in the last three months. You can Google in or type in the topic and the type of support group that you're looking for. And it's pretty amazing how people have really rallied and come together to really provide really an expansive network to help each other. Um, there's a whole slogan of we're in this together uh, is so true. That really is apparent as you look at what types of resources are available. Deanna, there's still a stigma though, that when it comes to behavioral health, people don't want to ask for help though. Um, what do you want to say to those folks who feel embarrassed almost to say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling right now. My kids are struggling and I, I just, I really need someone to talk to. Yeah. And they don't necessarily know how to open up like that. Yeah, you know, I think um, we have all had moments of struggling in the last th three months here. This is unprecedented. This is um, difficult for all of us. And I think this is a really important time when we go back as, in, as human beings and look at when I had a hard time in my life, what did I draw from to help me get through that? Um, people oftentimes draw from their faith, from their belief systems, from the love of their family. Um, I think that's really important. For those who struggle with asking for help, that's concerning to me. I think that most certainly we want to uh, make sure that there isn't a stigma that's attached to this whole uh, pandemic and folks who need to, uh, to reach out to each other Connection and contact is vital, I really believe, in being able to get through this, whether it's via a virtual platform, texting, chatting, calling a warm line. It's, it's more important than ever that we stay connected. Uh, for those of you just joining us here on Facebook Live, you are watching a discussion that I'm having with Dr. Amanda Suplee, one of our pediatric psychologists, as well as our Director of Patient and Family Services, Deanna Viegos Peters. We do have some very specific questions now from uh, some of our folks uh, from home who are tuning in. Um, one person asks, my son has a history of anxiety attacks, depression, and panic attacks. He recently made progress by developing coping mechanisms that included being more socially and physically healthy and active. When shelter in place began though, he not only socially distanced himself from others, but also isolated himself to the point where he's become mute. And so this parent, this concerned parent is asking, how can we best help him find new coping skills during this unprecedented times? And where do we begin with this onset of what appears to be agoraphobia? Um, I can start with that one. You, I wanna say to, to, first to that parent is that if your child has already started to develop um, coping skills prior to all this, that he has the ability to get those back um, and that he's likely just having a really difficult time adjusting as many people are. And I think especially for people who are struggling with mental health um, concerns prior to the pandemic and shelter in place, it's certainly gonna be heightened because you're not gonna have the same social supports as you had before trying to be creative with coping skills in a different way. So what worked for him to socially connect with people? I know it probably was being able to go to a friend's house, but is there a way that he can connect online with other people, even for a short amount of time? The most important thing is exposure. So if you have to start off with 30 seconds of something at a time, that's okay just to give him some sort of confidence that he can do this again. And then you increase that each time. So whether it's stepping out of the house for 30 seconds and then going back inside that day, the next day you do a minute and you can increase it from there and try and showing him that um, he can get that confidence back. That's great. Thank you so much. Deanna, you have something to add there? Yes, I think it's really important, um, even though there's so many virtual platforms in connecting with a therapist or a psychiatrist, that those routines and those appointments stay intact. Uh, of note, too, is whenever there is a change in behavior, 
record that has gone on for days or weeks that impairs one's ability to be able to do their life and manage their responsibilities. It's a really good idea to connect with that physician, a psychiatrist. Um, I do want to say that um, if this, this um, parent and child live in Fresno County, there also is a crisis stabilization center. I think it's really important to utilize those types of resources when an immediate assessment from a trained mental health professional is warranted. Um, there is one in Bakersfield, um, that also uh, sees adolescents as well as Fresno County. Those resources are available 24 seven and can be very helpful and, and getting some clarity around what's happening with her, her son. For those of you who um, are at your computer watching us or if you're watching this later on, you can go to valleychildrens.org slash COVID-19. There's a special section on that website, on our external website, um, where you can find all kinds of resources that Deanna and Dr. Sibley have both been mentioning. Again, that is a, it's a valleychildrens.org slash COVID-19. Uh, this next question comes from a new mom. I recently had a baby. She is still in the hospital there. All of this is overwhelming. Are there support groups for new moms who have newborns during this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I'll answer that. There actually are quite a few uh, support groups that are facilitated by moms um, on Facebook. I actually found several support groups um, that were exclusive to moms that are expecting in this year, 2020, as well as moms that have delivered in this year and especially during the pandemic. Um, I believe that information is also in, on our website. I would encourage this mom to take a look and scroll through to see if she can find a group that actually uh, stands out to her. Um, here's another one from a viewer. My nine-year-old keeps saying she doesn't have choices anymore. She can't choose where to go, who to see. She has no independence uh, at all. Uh, and this parent is asking, how can we foster a sense of empowerment in school-aged kids whose routine has been so disrupted? Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the importance of in routine and including your children and creating that but trying to be creative and offering other choices that are possible. I know it's not possible to go outside right now or go to a friend's house, but can she choose what the meal is for that day or what clothes to wear or what activities she does? Wherever you can offer some sense of control, even if it doesn't seem that big to us as adults, it's going to feel really big to a child. And so um, does she get to pick the movie for the day? Things like that. Any sense of control we can offer to a child can give them, um, it, it can help during a time when they're feeling really um, kind of just, it's just a chaotic time. So giving them a sense of control can help them feel a bit more grounded. Um, George's Pass is a program we have here at Valley Children's throughout our network that helps ease the stress and anxiety that children uh, with autism spectrum disorder or sensory issues might face. Um, there, there are some parents who are asking, how best can we support our George's Pass uh, children, children with special needs, um, Down syndrome, pre-verbal families. Um, what can we do to help that specific uh, population of families out there? Well, I can start with this one. I think in this case, it's going to be very important to reach out to all the care providers that you've already been working with, um, whether it is uh, occupational, physical, speech therapists, whether you're working with applied behavioral therapists in the community, many service providers have been going to telemedicine and being able to connect virtually to still provide services and be able to help even the most vulnerable population. I also would encourage families really to work on routines and structures. I think especially for children who have, um, who are in that population, they need a lot more structure and routine. And so working on that what is best for your family so we there are Yes, Diana, I'm sorry. Um, there are a couple of resources that were also added onto the George page that were exclusive to uh, for parents who are caring for kiddos with uh, these types of uh, disabilities. So I would encourage those parents to take a look at that. It's very exclusive to that uh, population. And I was impressed with the types of support that were made available. Okay, and again, that's on our website. That's uh, Valley children's.org slash COVID-19. So we did touch on, on, on parents whose, whose children may have been battling um, some issues before the pandemic. Um, we are getting more questions, it looks like, coming in now from parents who are saying, so how do we help our kids who are 
just now starting to exhibit signs of anxiety and they're starting to be extremely fearful. I think first step is to have an open and honest conversation with your children about what is going on because if they're just starting to show signs and symptoms, it's likely they're having struggles with adjusting to the new changes. So the conversation about what is going on, have a conversation with your family, like an action plan. These are the things that we are doing to keep ourselves safe and keep others safe. Having a plan of action can go a long way for a child because they're going to like, okay, I know I can do this to keep myself safe and it can decrease some of that fear. Um, and then also is just to keep, you know, come up with some sort of coping skills or some sort of activity that you can do maybe as a family, whether it's yoga together or going for a walk in a safe way together or watching a movie together, something to take their minds off of it. And then also know that there are there, you can always reach out to your local pediatrician or some of these other resources that Deanna was talking about previously, even if you're concerned about symptoms starting just now, there are still resources there to help you. I think validating feelings is really important too, um, to, to listen and be with your child and to provide reassurance. Um, while we don't have an answer and solution to this today, there are very smart people, doctors and scientists and epidemiologists. There are people that are working on trying to find a solution. And that is reassurance and that's a fact. That's a truth that a parent most certainly can share with their teen and with their children. Thank you both. Here's another question that we received. Social distancing has been very hard on my teen who feels cut off from their friends. She also faced big letdowns. This is a senior, it sounds like, because she's missed graduation, prom, an entire sports season, college visits, and other long planned events that have been just completely canceled. What are some tips to help some of these older kids navigate the loss of these milestones? Well, I think first of all, just like Deanna said, validate those feelings and let them know it's okay to be upset. Um, it's, it, it's not fair. The things that um, especially high school seniors are having to go through right now, something that is, you know, a rite of passage, something that they look forward to, certainly going to have symptoms of grief and loss associated with these things that they aren't going to have, um, something that they've looked forward to. So I think just first and foremost, let her know that it is okay to be upset. And I am here to talk to you whenever you need to talk about it. And then trying to come up with ways to make the, your children feel special and celebrate them in some way um, that works for your family. A lot of schools are doing modified drive through graduations or other parties. And if your school's not doing that, maybe they get to choose the dinner for that night and something that can make them feel celebrated um, and that they're not forgotten during this time. And I think it's also important to come up with ways to look forward to the future. Um, grieve what you're going through now, but have a plan of like, okay, what are we going to look forward to in the fall? Are you going to be starting college? Are you going to start a job? And something that might give them something to, to look forward to. Uh, when talking about grief, it's interesting because even there are, there are hundreds of us at Valley Children's who had to all of a sudden shift to working, working at home. And um, there was talk of, you know, I just, I just feel sad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a great point. It's a reminder just for me as a mom too, to say, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to own that grief because, because things are very different now than they were before. Absolutely. But we actually, we live, oh, sorry, Deanna. Okay, go ahead. Um, we live in a society that tells us that really sadness is not okay and that we have this mindset that we need to get rid of it. And ultimately, I like to look at it as like, how can I acknowledge it and then make it better? Mm -hmm. It's okay to be sad. This is a scary time that's unprecedented and however you feel is okay. And you're working from home now, so you're away from your social support. Parents are away from their other parent friends. Children are away from their friends. And that's a huge part of our life. Well, I like to say honor your feelings or honor the feelings that go along with this. It, 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 this is, it is what it is. And, you know, I was thinking about the parent 
who also is grieving that they're not getting to experience the milestones of their child graduating from high school and going to prom and having senior night. This isn't something that just teens look forward to. This is something that parents oftentimes are very engaged and actively involved in. So you've got a teen that's grieving and you've got an, a, an adult that's a grieving as well. You know, I think about the college age student who um, was graduating from college, who had to maybe come home, who lived independently for four years, maybe away from home. And in the fourth year of college at another milestone, um, instead of graduating, may have had to move home. Such a big adjustment for that young adult as well as the parent and having to adjust to each other all over again. Again, tremendous grief. Absolutely. A lot of families have, and schools have been turning to FaceTime, Zoom, uh, web-based uh, meeting uh, programs uh, to help everybody feel connected. Um, one mom, uh, one parent is asking, what do we tell our kids when FaceTime and Zoom simply aren't enough? You know, I think it goes back to validating that this isn't fair, and this is kind of what we have right now. So are there other ways that you can connect? I know that FaceTime and Zoom aren't enough, but that's probably because just talking one-on-one -on -one is not what most teenagers do. They're usually doing eight million things at once with their friends. Um, and so there are ways to watch movies together online. There are ways to play board games together online. So I think being creative with the opportunities that we have right now um, is limited and it's not fair and it probably isn't enough, but we can try and do what we can to make it make goodbye. Uh, so as we do transition, albeit slowly, from sheltering in place all the time to businesses, again, like restaurants, salons, slowly starting to open back up, how do you help explain to kids if you're the parent who's like, you must wear a mask, you must social distance, and then your kids might see, because we're seeing it in the news, we're seeing it in the public, there are a lot of people who refuse to wear a mask, who don't want a social distance, um, as parents who are trying to just keep their kids as safe as possible, and if they choose to, to really enforce these um, mitigation, these infection mitigation measures, how do you explain to your kids, listen, sometimes I mom, I said so, isn't enough. <laughs> so how do you help explain when they're going out in public and they're seeing potentially their own friends whose parents are not making them wear a mask or do whatever they want? But I think it's important to know every family is going to have different comfortable le comfortability levels and every person is going to feel different about these um, precautions lifting um, and being able to go back out. So I think first of all, being comfortable with where you are at for your family is really important and what makes sense for your family. And then ultimately being honest with your child and saying, this is what our family is choosing to do. And I am choosing to keep you safe and other people safe. And I'm going to let that family choose what's best for them. Uh, someone just left a comment on uh, our Facebook and said, my nine-year-old is feeling sad because he misses his teacher and students. He just wants to go back to school. That is a running theme that I have heard often. Um, every school has been different in terms of the ability for teachers to reach out to their students. So I'd, I'd encourage parents to reach out to the school to see if it's possible that they can, their child can connect with their teacher, um, connect with their friends in some way, um, drive by parties have been going on and parades and virtual um, connections have been happening. So I would just encourage that, that parent to reach out to the school to see what the options are, but know that it's normal. And it's, also, my heart. <laughs> it's also temporary. I think what's really important when we're speaking from a place of facts is this is the new normal for now. This is a temporary normal. We're evolving into where we're going to land with this. We don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know how long it's going to be until we get there. But I think that's also reassurance for a parent to be able to provide to their child. Uh, the, we did receive a few inquiries from uh, parents whose children are in daycares. Uh, daycares are considered essential. They didn't close down, but a lot of families did pull their children from daycares if they if they were able to do so. As they start going back, uh, the question is, how do we emotionally prepare our children for the new normal when they do go back to daycare? And then hopefully in August, September, when they do go back to school. 
So I think the first thing is to work with the daycare about what those um, social distancing or other requirements are going to be in place. If you know those ahead of time, you can have those conversations with your child, even a young child three, four knows something is going on because something is different. And so if you're able to practice at home what it's like to socially distance from a peer, sit in a different way than, a, you know, farther apart from someone else, the more that you practice those things, the more that they can be prepared. I think also just letting them know that these are to keep ourselves safe and other people safe. And there's a lot of adults in the world who are trying to keep them safe. Uh, there are questions. I know you touched on it briefly earlier, but but we're getting some more questions. Um, when it comes to trying to stay connected and using tools like um, iPads, tablets, cell phones, um, computers, uh, what are some tips either of you could give to keep your kids safe online? I, it really comes down to just monitoring what they have access to. Um, just as you would in any other capacity, we would encourage you to monitor the social media websites that they're using. Um, even if they're using a Zoom, try and have as much oversight over that or access to it as you can because there are scary things out there on the internet and that doesn't go away and actually we've seen a lot of increase um, in that because more people are using the internet um, and so I would just say be very diligent about monitoring that and always always limit you know we want children to connect virtually but there can still be a limit on screen time especially for their development. Uh, there's somebody who actually just asked us a question on our Instagram and said um, we cuddle as a family, but my kids are feeling the effects of touch starvation from others. Um, so how are some ways that I can help my child with that? Michelle on Instagram was asking that. That is a great question. I think a lot of people really are starting to feel that. And um, even if you were not like a quote unquote hugger before, you're definitely missing that touch. So I think as much as you can as a family, it's not going to fulfill all of that. But as much as you can as a family, provide that physical touch and then have a conversation about it. So like, you know, I know I'm really missing hugs too. I'm really missing hugs from my friends or grandma or grandpa or whoever it might be. And I think if you're just honest with your kids about it, it becomes a little less scary. A lot of times we feel like if we bring something up, it's going to make it worse. But actually by withholding that information, a lot of times kids just kind of come up with something in their head and it can be worse than what it really is. And that's something Deanna said earlier. You, you have to honor that feeling and you mm -hmm. have to acknowledge it. Yeah, absolutely. And it really, the more that you honor it and say, this is what I'm feeling right now. And you know what? Mommy or daddy is feeling that way too. Then they're going to know it's normal. And this is what we do. And if you can show them, hey, you know, I'm missing this too. Like, how about we hug? And this is what I do when I'm missing someone. I think someone on modeling, modeling the behavior, modeling what that looks like in terms of how you're managing your own feelings as an adult is really important in helping your child. And again, reminding them this is temporary. Today we cuddle as a family and someday soon you'll be able to cut, uh, hug your friends and be able to be with them. Don't know when, but that's coming soon. All right, Deanna, I'm holding you to it that you said it's temporary. <laughs> we'll get back to this <laughs> new normal someday. Uh, we did get a question um, on our, our Facebook. Uh, this person's 11 year old says he doesn't want to go back to school at all. He's scared he might get COVID-19 and now he's starting to get scared about getting sick in general. Mm -hmm. That is, I think gonna be um, a pretty common theme come the the school, the new school year. Um, I, and it's hard to say what it's going to be like in three months or two months when school starts again. But I think for right now, validate. I understand you are worried about that. It is a scary thing right now. And I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you safe. Going back to that action plan as a family of this is what we do to keep safe. We're going to stay inside or we're going to wash our hands frequently. When we go to the store, we wear masks. Those types of things can help exposure can be really important. So um, if you have to go outside for five minutes at a time and then increase it each time when you feel comfortable as a family, that's great. And then by the time school comes around, maybe those feelings will be different. 
we also don't know what the the climate's going to be like in two months and where we're going to be at in all this. So I also think that it's okay to say, you know what, right now I understand being scared and not wanting to go back. We'll, we'll talk about that as it gets closer. Uh, a new Facebook question that just came in. I have a child with special needs in a medical group home. He wants to know when we can see each other. What should I tell him? so that he understands. How do you explain something like this to an intellectually delayed child in a way that doesn't cause fear or confusion? Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing is that every parent knows their child best and what amount of information they can handle and how um, the, 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 their age, right? And how much age, is age appropriate information. And so really the way to go about this is just to say, as much of the facts as possible within their abilities and say, you know, there is a virus and we are trying everything to, we can to keep you safe and to keep ourselves safe. And for right now, they're saying that we can't visit, but I'm going to let you know as soon as I can come visit you. Um, and I think also, oh, I'm sorry. I think to partnering with the care home providers too, to see what information is being shared with. And this goes for any type of care home, I believe, um, that really working with the staff there to see what kind of restrictions are in place and what has been shared with the residents. So that way, when you're talking to them, whether it's um, ch children or adults. Thank you, Dr. Supli. Um, this one, um, maybe for you, Deanna. Um, what are some signs that my teen needs more emotional support during this time? How do you know when, when maybe just some one-on-one -on -one time between the caregiver, parent with the teen um, isn't enough? And what do you know when, to, when you should call your pediatrician and or a mental health professional? So I think um, the answer to this really applies to teens as well as adults. Um, when we see any disruption in normal uh, daily activities. If uh, we are sleeping more than usual, not sleeping enough, um, if we're not eating um, uh, as we should, we're eating more, eating less, um, activity has just diminished. If we're used to being an active person, we're sleeping a lot. Um, most certainly um, anyone who's showing any signs of withdrawal and isolation and not engaging or connecting, those would be signs that I would be concerned about, especially if it's prolonged and we're looking at days or even weeks of behavior that has changed so much that it actually affects your ability to do your day-to-day -day routines, managing your responsibilities, doing what's expected of you, whether that's a teen, um, your home chores, as an adult, um, doing your, your work. I think those are symptoms that we would be very concerned about and would fully support seeking additional help. Dr. Sipley, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think the only thing is, and you touched a little bit on it, is just, is this about consistency? So we all have bad days and we all have off, um, off days and there are going to be some times that are just a little harder. So we really want to look for a consistent pattern across days or week, especially for teenagers, because we know that irritability, changes in sleep and appetite are normal for teenagers. And so this is above um, what would be expected for them kind of consistent normally for them. Deanna, when, when um, many people had to shelter in place, work from home, um, something that Valley Children's recognized uh, early on was that sometimes the home life is not the safest for some kids. Um, what, are some, what are some things we as a community, even though we're apart, but we always try to say, you know, apart but together, what are some things that we can do um, to help make sure kids are getting what they need right now? In, in reference to safety? It's in reference to safety. Yeah, you know, this is a very difficult time. And I think Dr. Supli mentioned it earlier when, we, when she identified that maybe irritability, having a shorter fuse is definitely a sign of coping. Unfortunately, we see this with grown people as well. And this, this circumstance most certainly is stretching um, all of us in terms of resilience and our coping. And folks who maybe don't have the healthiest coping um, definitely uh, are at risk and potentially not being able to keep their kids as safe as we would want them to. There is information again on the George page in reference to helping uh, a parent or caregiver on how to get help for themselves in order to have the tools that and the skills that they need to not only be okay during this time, but to also ensure that their kids are being kept safe. 
Um, and again, as, as Deanna mentioned, if you go to uh, valleychildrens.org slash COVID-19, uh, there are a list of resources, not only if you are in need of some behavioral health assistance, but also um, food banks and other programs that might be able to help your families during this time. Again, that's valleychildrens.org slash COVID-19. Question came in from a parent who says, my five-year-old is an only child. I'm worried because he is missing out on so much socialization that when things open up again, he will struggle to return to normal, um, especially around school. Any tips to help fill the gap for him since he is an only child and there's no other kids for him to interact with right now? And I will say, unfortunately, we don't know what the long-term effects of all this is gonna be just because this is so impressive. Presented, um, and that we hope that our ways of connecting virtually and other things we've put in place will help, but ultimately we don't know. I think the most important thing to do is if you can connect virtually with other peers, whether it's from um, kids at school or cousins that are near his age, to connect uh, virtually, but also spend time playing with them yourself. Um, and it's hard as adults to play it's really important for kids to play. So if you can take 10, 15 minutes out of your day to just spend that time with him, that actually will help um, to kind of bridge that gap, even though it's not exactly the same. Okay. Um, I, that's, that's a look. I think we covered all of the questions people asked. Um, they, they fell in, okay, let's see. We just got a new one in. <laughs> so let's, uh, it says, um, as talk about reopening schools, uh, I work as a special education aide my younger students love to hug. Um, what happens when things go back to, again, this normal state? And if there are still guidelines that we have to maintain six feet of distance and not being able to hug, um, this person says, I, I too miss hugging um, and being compassionate when there's a child crying or hurting. So how, how you've told us kind of coping mechanisms for kids, but what about for us? Dion and I are huggers too. So. <laughs> I think it's really important for us as adults to figure out what our coping skills are. Most of us do not know. Um, we kind of just get by day by day. And I think now is a perfect time to just kind of evaluate what makes you, I always think, what makes me feel good? What makes me feel calm? Whether it is watching TV um, or going for a walk or baking something or taking some deep breaths doing yoga, there's a wide variety of things that are healthy coping skills um, that can help us manage. And I think it's really important to figure out what it is for you, because what works for you might not work for me. So figure what those are and have some time to practice them uh, before schools go into place. I always say that coping skills are not effective without practice. If I tell you to take a deep breath when you're in the middle of being upset, it's not going to work. So you need to practice, practice, practice. And, and so now is actually a really good time to do that. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Amanda Supli, Deanna Vegas McPeters. Uh, appreciate you both taking uh, time out of your day to help us. Um, and we're, we're still gonna get lots of questions. So if anyone still has questions, just post them on our Facebook or Instagram accounts and we'll get the answers from Dr. Supli or Deanna. Thank you both very much for your time. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And again, uh, for a list of those resources, you can go to our website, valleychildrens.org slash COVID-19. We also have a COVID-19 hotline um, that we are staffing from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, every day. The number is 888-286-9336. That's 888-286-9336. Um, that's a lot of information to take in. So again, if you go to our website, you go to our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, you know how to find us, Valley Children's, as it has been for the last 70 years, is still there for you and your families. Uh, thank you again to everybody uh, watching from their tablets, from their phones, um, and stay safe, everybody. Thank you.